Hi, welcome back to the channel. My name is Mark, and if you're like me and you like watching YouTube videos about watchmaking and watches in general, then you will have noticed that most of these serious watchmakers have their own watch cleaning machines. Now, today on this episode, I was lucky enough to get a watch cleaning machine from one of my friends, but unfortunately it came to me like this in pieces. The finish was flaking and peeling and the wiring was, well, it was pretty messed up. The original cloth covered wiring was frayed and spliced into other wire. It was not really connected very well and it was just not safe to operate or pleasant to look at, to be honest. I definitely knew that I needed to at least rewire this unit, if not fully restore it. So I thought I'd make a quick video and hit the highlights of what was involved to get this vintage machine back up and running and looking respectable again. While doing research for this project, I found it very difficult to find any wiring diagrams. So after looking at tons of pictures and studying the parts that came off of this machine, I was able to reconstruct the wiring paths and put together a diagram of my own, which I have included in this video. But first, let's get started with the outside of the machine, and that means stripping off the old paint. To do this, I used a product called Citrus Strip. I got it at Lowe's for about 12 bucks. I like this stuff a lot because you can use it indoors without a lot of fumes. I'll demonstrate how to use it on this part of the motor housing that I haven't stripped yet. Basically, you just brush it on with one of these uh, cheapo dollar paintbrushes. And then you cover it with plastic wrap. Now, don't be afraid to use a pretty thick coat of it. That will definitely help it. Now I found that leaving it overnight works the best, but if you're in kind of a hurry, I guess you could do it in maybe three or four hours. But I let this, uh, like I said, cure or soak in overnight. And the next day I just scraped off most of the wrinkled up paint with a plastic putty knife. I used some Q-tips to get the loose paint from out from under some of the hard to reach areas. And then I wiped it down with a paper towel. As a last step, I used some isopropyl alcohol on a paper towel and wiped it down again. After the old finish has been removed, you'll discover that there are some deep scratches that were left um, from where they removed excess metal from the original casting process. These marks had been originally filled in, but most likely the filler will be removed with the old finish. And they are going to have to be filled in again in order to get a smooth finish again. I used some Bondo glazing and spot putty that I picked up at Walmart for about seven bucks. It's super simple to use. Just apply some to the rough areas and spread it out with a putty knife. It dries pretty quickly depending on how thick you put it on, but definitely thinner is better. And you can add multiple coats if you need to. So once it dries, you can just sand it smooth with some 120 grit sandpaper.
So when you're done with that, it should look like this. So in order to get a nice finish from the paint, you need to make sure that the surface is clean and free from any grease. So one final good wipe down with mineral spirits should do it. For the paint, I'm using Black Wrinkle Plus by VHT. Now, if you've never heard of this paint, it's probably because it's normally used on engine parts and you can actually get it at an auto parts store. I found this can at AutoZone and it was about 12 bucks. So according to the directions, you're supposed to apply at least three heavy coats in a crosshatch pattern. The first coat should be done horizontally, the second coat should be done vertically, and the third coat diagonally. You should also allow about five minutes between the coats. Here I am spraying it. And I'm going to speed up the video a little bit because you don't really need to see all of this. Now this stuff dries pretty slowly, but they say that you can bake the part in the oven for an hour at 200 degrees to cure the paint. It says that the wrinkle effect will be tighter this way. Well, I went ahead and cured the parts in the oven. Now, as you can see, the motor housing turned out really good and the wrinkle effect looks nice. But for some reason, the base looks like I just painted it with regular flat black paint. I didn't like that at all. So I stripped down the base and I tried it again. The only thing I can think is that I hadn't cleaned the surface good enough the first time and that the effect of the wrinkling um, was somehow affected by that. The second time turned out much better and matched the motor housing. So I'm pretty happy with the way it looks. All right, so let's move on to the wiring. Basically, the tools and materials I use to rewire this thing are pretty simple. Something to strip the wires with. In this case, I'm using an X-Acto knife, a wire cutters, and some type of pliers. I also used some wire connectors, splices, and ring terminals, and some heat shrink tubing to get some nice, clean, professional looking results. As for the wire, I needed a power cord anyway, so I decided to get two of the 10 foot long, 14 gauge replacement power cords. Each one of these cords contains three 14 gauge wires in a PVC jacket that are green, white, and black. These will handle 125 volts so they can safely handle the current that they will be carrying for this repair. Now in order to use the wires individually, I had to remove them from the outer covering. So that is where I use the needle nose vice grips to pull the wires out of the sleeve. Now once I had them removed, I just stripped away a quarter of an inch to a half an inch of the plastic to expose the bare wire. Yeah. 
Then I just twist the ends and select the connector I wanted to use. In this case, I use mostly ring connectors. You simply slip the wire in and then crimp the end around it. Again, I'm using the vice grips for this. Then, in order to get a nice, neat connection and to cover the exposed wire, I slipped a portion of heat shrink tubing over the end and heated it up using a Zippo lighter. The heat sucks it up nice and tight and the wire and the connector are both connected. Now the reason I'm putting these connectors on the ends of the wires is so that I can use brass machine screws, nuts, and washers to make the connections to the different components within the watch cleaning machine. And since I'm not very good at soldering, this will allow me to make sure I get a good solid connection. So those are the basic techniques I used, nothing too difficult or expensive really. Now that you've seen how I refinished the base and the motor housing and the basic techniques I used for preparing the wires, it's time to see where all the wires get connected. Now I filmed every bit of the wiring process and it took me about an hour and a half. And while editing this video, I discovered how useless it was to actually sit and watch it. I decided that it would be better to show you which wires needed to be connected and where, and then you can figure out the best way to route the wires for your own particular situation. The components that need to be connected are shown here. There's the rheostat, which turns the motor on and off and controls its speed. The heater, which aids in drying the parts. The light socket, which actually turns on to indicate when the heater is on, not when there is power to the machine. Uh, there's also a two position toggle switch, which turns the heater on and off. And finally, a three position toggle switch, which has an up position, a down position, and a middle position. This controls the direction of the motor and can also turn off the motor when in the center position. The only parts that had to be replaced were the two toggle switches. All the other parts, including the light bulb, are original. So here's the money shot, the diagram which shows the path the wires take. Here's where you will really appreciate the wires being different colors. Okay, so before we begin wiring up anything, uh, this is where I have to tell you that, uh, that this is how I wired my machine. I'm not an electrician, nor do I claim to be. Electricity is dangerous, and if you don't feel comfortable dealing with this, then hire a professional. 
All the connections that I made were done with the machine unplugged. At no time would I ever recommend plugging this machine into a live wall socket. Okay, so begin by finding the power cord. This is what plugs into the wall. The first wire to look at is the green wire. This is the ground wire and it just connects to one of the screws on the base of the machine. It doesn't really matter which one, just one that's convenient. Next you'll notice that there's a black wire coming from the power cord. That one connects to the right side of the heater. There are little loops on each side of the heater so it's super easy to just put a machine screw through that loop and the ring terminal you attach to the end of the black wire. Then just add a washer and a nut and you've got a really easy, really solid connection. You'll notice that the black wire then gets connected to one of the terminals on the light socket and then continues on and ends up with a connection to the center terminal on the three-way toggle switch that I've labeled motor direction. Now going back to the power cord, you will now connect the white wire to the terminal on the speed control and then to one of the terminals on the other toggle switch that I've labeled heater on off. Next, run another length of the white wire from the other terminal of the heater switch to the other terminal of the heater and then to the open terminal on the light socket. After those are all connected, you will notice that the only connections we have left are those that go to the motor. Those are really easy. Just connect the green wire to the open terminal on the speed control and the other two wires to the open terminals on the direction control switch. One on the top and one on the bottom. Now it really doesn't matter which of the three wires you choose to go where unless you want the motor to turn a particular direction when uh, it's in a when the switch is in a certain position. If that's what you want then you're going to have to do a little bit of experimenting just um, switching back and forth those other two wires. So after I got everything wired up this is how it looks. I did have the center support re-nickel plated, which cost around 75 bucks, but I think it was worth it. I'm pretty happy with how it turned out, and I hope you found this video helpful and entertaining. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comments section below. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel as I will have more projects coming up, as well as some product reviews of new watchmaking tools as I acquire them. So until next time, be safe and God bless.